All right, hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome to the live stream. We are going to go through the behind the scenes stuff on the carburetor video, the transparent carburetor video. We're going to interact with some questions for patrons of Smarter Every Day going on here in the live chat up here above me. And then after that, uh, we're going to just play with some stuff. I got some calipers, I've got some, you know, got some carburetor stuff here, things of that nature. Should be really, really fun. Let's give it a go. So without further ado, we are going to start the video here and uh, let's go. All right, so play. This is a carburetor and this is a special 3D printed see-through carburetor and this is a high-speed camera with a macro lens on it. You see where this is going. If you've ever cranked some type of lawn care product with a small engine on it, you have interacted at some point with a carburetor. The question is, what does this little device do? Yes, it mixes air and fuel together, but how? Like, I want to understand how it works. As a mechanical engineer, I thought I had an understanding of carburetors until the day I went to visit my dad who was replacing a carburetor on his tiller. My dad. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about how this video started, how this came to be. Um, basically, this was in the middle of lockdown, COVID lockdown, and I had not seen my dad in weeks. It, it was maybe months. It was a long, long time. And I was getting bummed out, to be honest. I, I really wanted to see my dad. So I went over one morning. I got a cup of coffee. I was like, I just need some deep wisdom. I need to go talk to my dad. I went over there, and he was just working on a tiller. It was really, really cool. And I do agree with you, Chevron Q. My dad is awesome. So anyway, um, basically, I showed up, he's working on this carburetor, and I'm supposed to know what a carburetor is, right? Like, a mechanical engineer, that's kind of a thing, engines. Engines are your thing, right? But I really wanted to just have a moment with my dad, so I wasn't thinking he could teach me anything. I was like, ah, oh, you know, he'll take it apart, show me some stuff. I know about the, you know, the Venturi and stuff like that, but I'm not going to learn a whole lot. Holy cow, was I wrong. So what you're about to see here is dad just basically dropping knowledge. So what I wanted to do in the video here is I wanted to establish the fact that dad was sensei, actually called it sensei montage. And my goal was to just in the shortest amount of time possible without giving everybody the whole behind the scenes of what dad taught me, I wanted to establish the fact that he knew what he was talking about. And so I just let this play. Dad is a really good teacher and he has a really good understanding of how mechanical things work. So I decided to suspend everything I thought I knew about carburetors and just ask him to teach me from the ground up. Teach me. What followed was a 45 minute lesson on everything about carburetors. That's the main jet of carburetors. See the hose on the side? Bowl. You got gasoline in there. Uh huh. Float. See the needle going up and down right there? Yes, sir. Yes, that's the throttle right there. You can see that. Choke. You're running open right there. The suction, the intake. When the cylinder goes down, it's a vacuum. It, it sucks air through here, your finger right there, and the vacuum will pull this open. The valve closes in the cylinder, the compression stroke comes up, compresses the gasoline, the spark plug fires, pushes it back down. I really enjoyed uh, that moment because what happened is I pulled my phone out and just started recording and my dad's smart He knows what I'm doing when I'm recording. He's like Destin's gonna use this for something And so there's this thing where you try to be natural, but you also You know try not to perform you know this I see this happen when I turn a camera on and I pointed at somebody I see this happen all the time and uh, It was really fun to see that happen to my dad that that little smirk you see right there um, It's let me show you Works well he says that little smirk is, uh, that is something that he's trying to suppress. He knows that he's being recorded. He knows I'm going to do something with it. He doesn't know what. And so that was really fun for me to see. I really enjoyed it. When, basically, here, let's switch over here. I'll show you what he showed me. Um, and, and I'll be taking some questions uh, here for a few minutes here. So this is the carburetor, uh, essentially, that, that Dad was working on. This isn't the exact one. But this is a comparable one. This is a Briggs and Stratton style uh, aluminum carburetor. It's really fun. You you can take the bottom off uh, the bowl. Uh, here, let's just do that. Let's take off this bottom of the bowl here. So this, you know, 
you, you know what a carburetor looks like, right? The thing that kind of com- confused me, if you watch the second channel um, extended cut with Dad, his description of the jet um, confused me a little bit because of how the conversation went down. Um, the problem is, if you look really far down in the bottom of this thing, there are actually, here, going to work on focus for a second, there are actually two holes. Can I Can I focus? I cannot. I will figure this out eventually. It'll take me a second. There are two holes down there, and that's what confused me. I'll, I'll, I'll get that figured out in a minute. Once I got that figured out, uh, I understood most of what worked. But what's interesting about these is if you look on the choke side of a carburetor, there are two holes there. Those holes are to allow it to run during idle. There's all kinds of things in a carburetor we did not talk about in the video, and it's, it's fantastic stuff. It's, it's actually magical. It, it's, it's a thing that evolves. I, I have to imagine at a, at a plant like Briggs & Stratton, the engineers that work on this stuff just kind of discover what works as opposed to designing for it. And so that's really, really fun for me to consider. Uh, I'm going to take some questions here. Are the small holes... Let's see. One second. Let me... Oridar says, are the small holes in the metal choke throttle flappy dues to prevent the throttle or choke from being used to completely cut off airflow? Well, um, it's that's really a good question. That's an insightful question, and it's a very complicated question, actually. Let's go over to this other one. So you see this this carburetor right here? Just behind this little plug here, um, if you look really close, there are little bitty holes you see those little holes? They're hard to see. They're in there on the side. What I learned, th- there you go, you can see them just to the side of the throttle there. You see that little lever? Those three little holes. What's interesting is as the throttle closes, i got to free the throttle up before I can close it. As the throttle closes, you see how some of the holes are exposed and some of them are not based on where the throttle is? That's actually a very complicated design trick that has to do with transitioning from a low RPM to a high RPM. So uh, your question that you asked, Oradar, is what are the little holes? Uh, The ones in the metal are so that it can run during idle, but it's far more complicated than that. There are other holes that have to do with when demand is requested of the carburetor and you want more power, you can't go from low RPM to high RPM immediately. You need a transition period. So it's like a, a Bezier instead of a linear demand or a step function. That's what those little holes on the side are. I had no idea any of this existed. Also, downstream of the throttle, the throttle, as it closes up, let me go back here. As the throttle closes, it actually acts as another Venturi. You can actually see that better on this one. So like as flow, here let's just go back here, as flow is going across the Venturi, what will happen is, let's open the choke up, as that throttle closes down, as it closes down, the air fuel mixture has to sneak around it on the top, and that creates a second Venturi. So you get another vortex in there, so you get better mixing. It's complicated. Anyway, I could keep talking about this, but let's just watch the video and keep going. Sorry about that. So my dad gave me a master class in how carburetors work. What I'm going to do is try to explain in brief detail what he taught me, and then we'll move on to the see-through carburetor where I think you can understand it a little bit better. So most carburetors are either aluminum or thermoplastic. So let's look at this aluminum here. Most carburetors have some things that all look familiar, like you've got some kind of little turny thing here. On this side, you got another little floppy do. And down here, if you take off the bottom, you can see that there's some type of container on the bottom and a little thing on the inside, right? All this looks kind of normal. Like if you've ever looked at an engine, you've seen stuff that looks like this. The thermoplastic version, kind of the same way, okay? So what I want to draw your attention to is there's two main components to a carburetor. There's the top part and the bottom part. And the top part is called the venturi and the bottom part is called the bowl. So in order to understand this, I tried to figure out if I could find a see-through carburetor and I found two different versions. Number one, I actually found a see-through carburetor on the internet. Okay, this guy 
was very, very adamant about this. Like, had to sign a thing saying, we will not run gasoline through this clear carburetor. It was a thing. And I don't really know why. I assume he's been given access to the molds by Briggs and Stratton. Because you got, I mean, that is a complicated injection mold. That is complicated. And if you look at it, let's go back to my top-down coffee cam here. If you look at the clear injection mold here and the not clear injection mold, they are very, very, I'm sorry, they are very, very similar. So in order to create those parts, they are probably running those things on a similar mold machine. So my guess is this guy's paying good money for that, and he does not want to um, lose the privilege of getting those parts molded. I thought that was really interesting. Internet. The problem is the guy that sold it to me made me promise I wouldn't run gasoline through this. It was for teaching only, and I'm a man of my word, so we're not going to run gasoline through this carburetor. So I was left to try to find other sources for see-through carburetors, and I found one on the internet. There's a young man in Pennsylvania. He created this. It's basically a see-through Venturi. Which... So this guy's name is, uh, I think it's Joachim or Joachim. I don't know how to pronounce his name, but he's a young student from Penn State University. He was really cool. I contacted him a long time ago, asked him when I was first figuring out that I wanted to do a, a see-through carburetor, and he was really cool to work with. So check out MakerJ101 on YouTube. Which is part of a carburetor, but it didn't quite do what I wanted, which was to show the complete inner workings of the carburetor. So at this point, it's clear we're going to have to make our own see-through carburetor. And remember, there's two components of the carburetor, right? Okay, first, let's talk about the Venturi. If you are like me and you have really old books on your shelf, you might have one that explains carburetors in great detail and explains... Okay, a ton of people asked me about this book. I got it right here. There's a lot of pieces. Okay, the book is this one right here. It is How Things Work. This is volume two. This thing, oh, it's so beautiful. Look at this book. Oh, it's amazing. See that? Oh, it's just, it's glowy and shimmery. I have no idea where this came from. Um, I, I think I got it at a yard sale. I don't exactly remember, but I just know that it is absolutely beautiful i got to figure out my my camera situation here because i have to reach right here in order to focus who knows if that works but anyway it is an absolute beautiful thing sorry for the oscillation got some simple harmonic motion of you there so um let's see when this thing was written look at that like the whole engraving look isn't that beautiful illustrations researched by roger jean sigalat i don't know let's see i need a year Table of contents, how things work. Come on, give me a year. I, I know they made th these things in the 60s and 70s. Can somebody, ISBN, no, I, I think this is before ISBN, everybody. If you could uh, if you could find this, um, someone asked what the book is in the SED subreddit. I had screen grabbed the video and go Googling. Okay, so I would love if somebody could figure this out. That would be Really, really cool. But it is a beautiful book. I got it at either an antique shop or a used bookstore. Um, the local used bookstore actually just changed ownership. That's a big deal to me. So Dan Howarth says uh, someone asked what it was in the Smarter Everyday subreddit, and he's looking that up. Anyway, okay, it's a great book, How Things Work. That's volume two. Here we go. It's that a Venturi is a really cool thing where you take fluid that's flowing through a pipe if you neck it down at some point to a smaller cross-sectional area, the static pressure at that point, at the throat, decreases, creating kind of like a vacuum in that one spot. Well, that can be used to suck fuel up into the Venturi. All right, so let's look at that. So the Venturi part of the carburetor is for sucking the fuel up into the line. The second part of the carburetor, the bowl, is for holding the fuel. So after a lot of collaboration, conversations, and actual engineering meetings... Okay, I want to talk about this for a second. So what you're looking at right there is a meeting. Um, so Trent, we use this as an opportunity to teach Trent engineering. So books are from 1993. No way! I found one looks like yours is from 1990. Nick Bauer says... Uh, 1993, Roland Felnar, 
um, says 1990. Had no idea. Man, I really wanted it to be from the 60s. It just felt better if it was from the 60s. Felipe says seems to be from 1969. Interesting. Okay, anyway, back to Trent. So as you exit engineering school, you you really only know how to learn. That's pretty much all you know. And you don't have any, I don't know, subject matter expertise. We'll call it that, right? So what we did is uh, you see on the left, you see my dad and you see David Linderman. Um, David is uh, a sage old engineer that has done a lot of really cool stuff with me here at Smarter Every Day. Um, also in that meeting, we had Jeremy Fielding. So you see Jeremy Fielding on the right there, um, me, and you had dad and uh, David Linderman. And so what we did is we made this a design review and made Trent spend a lot of time doing this design and I oversaw the design of the thing. And so if you've ever been a part of an engineering uh, program like this, the way it works is you've got an engineer that you report to, you design it, you take it to them and they bleed all over the paper. That's kind of what we did here. So uh, it was really cool. Engineering meetings. I'll show you what we, we did. We came up with a 3D printed solution for a see-through carburetor. It consists of a laser 3D printed housing, which incorporates both the Ventura. I'm going to stop right here. That time lapse took me two days. I spent three hours doing that. This is a Form 3. Uh, Shane designed and worked on the Form 3 project. That was kind of his thing, the stuff made here guy. Um, and so... I called Form Labs and I was like, hey, I want to do a time lapse of your 3D pr printing thing, right? Your 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 whole 3D printer. They were like, oh, great, no problem. We would love to do that. Um, how do we do it? And I'm like, I don't know. So the problem is the Form 3, it's a resin printer. And so the print platform comes down, touches the resin, uh, a laser fires on the thing. You had a goniometer that changes the angle of the laser, but it'll go up and then it'll go back down to the resin to get the, the distance correct. And I think the reason it does that has to do with air bubbles and things of that nature. You wanna clear the resin and then come back down to it. That's what you're doing. And it has to do with the focal distance and it's gotta be fluid dynamics. I have no idea, but that has to be what it is. So the problem is when you're time-lapsing it, if you just record the thing and you go boop, 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 it looks so jerky and weird, especially if you accelerate it. This was a, a four hour print. So in order to get this right, there were 650 layers. I actually printed a 60% model. This right here that you're seeing, this is not the real model. The real model is, oh man, I, I should have actually just grabbed the, the scale version. It's in the other room, but whatever, you get it. So I'm gonna do that. I can do that. I'm an adult, hold on a second. So this, is the scale model that I printed for the video itself. And this is how big the thing actually was. So the model in the print, or excuse me, yeah, the model in the video that you're seeing is not the actual thing. It's actually way, way bigger. It's like a 10 hour thing to print. And um, I was like, you know, I don't wanna edit however many thousand frames that is, 1,400 frames, I, I'll edit 600. <laughs> and so it took three and a half hours to go through and edit all the jogs out of this thing, which was insane. That was a whole day, basically, between that and phone calls and all the normal stuff. Now I have resin. I'm going to go put this back again because I'm an adult. One second. You can look at this video. Actually, I'm going to just come play it for you while I'm gone and the bowl, and we removed a float and needle from a thermoplastic carburetor made by Briggs & Stratton. We laser cut a front cover that would allow you to see the entire thing, and then we 3D printed a choke and throttle lever out of PLA plastic. So this is the 3D printed see-through carburetor. On an earlier episode of Smarter Every Day, I described a see-through engine, and we actually got to see the combustion happen inside the cylinder. Basically, there's four... I got back just in time to see that clip from that original Smarter Every Day video. That is from uh, me going to hang out with um, Everett in New Jersey, in Cinnamon, New Jersey, the see-through engine video, 805 Road King, great dude, 
A lot of fun. Go check him out if you want to. Combustion happen inside the cylinder. Basically, there's four strokes to a four-stroke engine. You have the intake stroke, which is where it's pulling in fuel-air mixture into the cylinder. After that, you have the compression stroke, which compresses the fuel-air mixture. And then you have the ignition at the spark plug, which creates the power stroke driving down the piston. And then the valve at the top opens, and you push out the exhaust out of that valve, and you start the whole thing over again. You have intake, compression, power, exhaust. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. The interesting thing about the intake I have a regret, and this is a serious, serious regret I have for the video. I wish I had used the four words, suck, squeeze, bang, blow. That's how an engine works. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Um, the problem is people have dirty minds and they're like, oh, that's, you know, you're being crass. That's how engineers remember it. So it's a thing. It works with jet engines as well. So you, you suck in the fuel, you squeeze it down, compress it, bang, that's your ignition and your power stroke, and blow, that's your exhaust. That's how engines work. And so that's what I'd love for you to remember, suck, squeeze, bang, blow. I don't know why I didn't put that in the video. I, I wanted to, I just didn't, so my bad stroke is that it is a vacuum. It is sucking air into the engine. And what we can do is we can take advantage of that. Hang with me. This is a little bit complicated. So this is question from Nick Sadler. Would it be possible to have both the clear carburetor and the clear engine in the same shot? Yes, it would. And I think that'd be really, really cool. The carburetor and let's assume the engine is out here to the right it's taking advantage of the fact that the intake stroke has a vacuum and it makes air want to flow this way into the engine so once air starts flowing this way what happens is air comes in this side and it starts necking down into the venturi there like we said in our book earlier where flow is high pressure is low and so if you have gasoline down here in the bowl down here all full up right here what you do is you have a little bitty pipe right here, like a straw that goes up and goes into the center of the Venturi. And what that does is that creates a little bitty jet of liquid that comes up right here because of that vacuum. And then once that happens, it mixes and then it goes downstream into the engine like this. So basically you have nothing but air on this side. You've got the fuel coming up here and then you have a mixture that goes from here forward. That's basically what a carburetor does. The choke in the throttle up top, that's the flappy things we were showing earlier. That's the choke and that's the throttle. Basically what they do is control the mixture that goes to the engine. If you close off the choke and you restrict the amount of air that goes down into the Venturi, then you can create what's called a rich mixture, meaning the mixture that goes to the engine is rich in gasoline. You might want to do that if you're starting the engine and it's having a hard time firing up. If you want to lean the mixture like this, that means the mixture downstream is lean of gasoline. And there are different reasons to do different things, but if you have an ideal mixed choke right here and you have full throttle, then you're going to have great chemistry downstream and it's going to make the engine run really, really fast. So these are the two controls that most carburetors have. I read somewhere that great chemistry or the ideal stoichiometric mixture of fuel and air is 14.7 to one for gasoline. I don't know that. I just find it interesting that it correlates to 14.7 PSI is atmospheric pressure. And I can remember that. I may be wrong about that, but Felipe, by the way, says you can find those four books on eBay. Thank you for doing the, the legwork on that. DJ Alex um, 155 says, is there any significance to the Venturi being symmetric? I don't know. I do not know. I do know that it's very, very important that the geometry is smooth. Um, it, it has to do with the boundary layer on the inside of, uh, you call it the throttle body, whatever you want to call it. It's important that you have a smooth, uh, a smooth edge coming in because that affects your boundary layer thickness, essentially, which also affects your mixing. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, I'm no expert. I'm regurgitating things I read. Uh, I am not a carburetor expert. And this is basically the simplest design for a carburetor that can exist. So let's go get Dad to show us how to use this thing and see if we can catch it in slow motion. The first thing we had to do is actually hook the gas line up. I'm sorry, I'm going to bite on Derek's. Uh, Derek Scalon says, if a certain amount of oxygen is needed, to burn fuel, then why does the mix need to change? That's a really good question. And that actually has uh, huge implications for rockets. So for example, 
if you knew the exact stoichiometric mixture of the fuel to the oxidizer, why would you ever run anything but the perfect mix? And the answer has to do with thermodynamics, usually. Like, for example, on a injector plate at the head of a combustion chamber for rockets, sometimes you'll want to run something along the outside edge of the rocket, whether it be um, fuel or oxidizer, depending on which one's more dense and which one you know you can carry more of. So what you might want to do is run that on the outside of the nozzle. So your injector plate would be like one-to-one -one mixing or whatever your stoichiometric mixture is so that it would go boom in the right in the right way. But you could have some cryo fluid on the outside edge and that would cool or give you a boundary layer on the inside of your nozzle to keep it from melting. Fascinating stuff. Literally rocket science. Smart people do all that math. To the carburetor. Okay, I'm going to open the fuel. Here goes. And it'll just fill up. It should. I felt, I felt really stupid when this happened. I don't know why. Didn't you know that's what the no, bowl was No, I did for? not know that was what was going to happen. Well, yeah. The I mean, it's obvious now that you do yeah. it. Fuel flows in here, and when the float starts to float, it moves this needle, which presses into the seat and stops the flow of fuel into the bowl, so you always have the right amount. So one thing that was interesting about that is the... The needle, I feel like I could have done a better job explaining this on the video. So let, let me show you what I mean by that. So let me come over here to the coffee cam, and we're going to look at, um, let's take this one apart. So let's zoom in here on this. Oh, I don't have a float in there. Let's look at this one. All right, so you see the carburetor here, and you see the float. This is how this works. I, I could have done a better job of this in the video, okay? So we've got the float there. The needle goes right there. And the needle is just a small pin with a little rubber, a little rubber stopper at the top. The seat is that brass thing inside the carburetor. You see that? So what you can do is, uh, the way it works is you just take the needle and you put it inside the float like that. You take that pin and you have it about halfway over like that. You see how this interacts right here? So the pin just goes right down there. Oop, except it's upside down because I'm stupid. All right, rotate this thing around. You, you kind of have to hold the pin in. You see how it's held in that slot? And then you, you want to get your pin just right. You let it go into the seat there, turn it upside down, and then you snap it in. Listen to this. Isn't that acoustically pleasing? And so now what you have is you have a needle that's in there that's controlled by the float. The problem is it is really, really hard to see that um, in this video. So I could have done, okay, here, we maybe can see it there. Let me, let me hold, let me focus. I'm focusing through glass, it's not that great. So as the float moves, it's just so hard to see. As the float moves, that, that needle goes up and down, and it seats into the seat. And the whole idea is as the, you see my, my mouse here? As the float goes up, that needle goes into the seat, and it plugs it up. The problem is we made this post. Trent designed that post based on something he measured with calipers, right? When he got that offset, there was a little bit of binding there. Not on purpose. That's just the way it happened. And it, you know, depending on the quality of the print, and if there was a little support on the Formlabs print in there, it's it's not ideal, right? So it rubbed a little bit in there. So when we did the first load, it didn't go all the way up and seat. It actually bound, and so we overfilled the carburetor and had gas over the float. Blow a fuel into the bowl so you always have the right amount. Now, backfiring is an issue, right? It is an issue, and how about getting this <laughs> ready to go? Yeah, because we spilled some gasoline a few minutes ago. So, so if if a backfire happens, if I understand correctly, fire is going to come backwards, back into the carburetor, mm -hmm. and we did not pressure test this carburetor. Right. So this this could explode, and all this gas could be on fire and go around us, right? Hopefully not. <laughs> As a matter of fact, open the door just a little bit, let whatever vapor's here on the floor go out. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Oh, I saw some vapor. Did you? Hey, on the intake stroke. Yeah, I'm, we're going to see it. Oh, you're on it. Okay, I 
trigger. We can kill it. Kill it, yeah. You can see the vapor in the intake. Can you? Yeah, you can. Oh. Did you see it? No. What do you mean you didn't see that? I'm looking for fire. <laughs> <laughs> I love that moment. <laughs> I was looking for fire. We have southern accents here in Alabama. My dad and I are rednecks, and um, we are very proud of that heritage. <laughs> uh, no, in, in all seriousness, though, uh, I like the moments where dad just totally forgets about the camera, and he his brain goes completely into the thing we're doing mode, and that's when you know the magic's going to happen. <laughs> okay, did you catch it? With the, I, I, I don't know. It, I think I, I hit the buttons. <laughs> it was running rich and sputtering, sput, 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 sput. So I opened the choke up so it would lean out the mixture and it started running smoother. Like it like it was actually supposed to be used? Well, yeah, that's where it's, <laughs> that's where it's supposed to work. I didn't know there'd be bubbles and things here. Oh, look at, oh, that. Look at that. Is it? it? Yep. You can see that the uh, carburetor's over full here. Gas is over the bowl, that, or over the float, that's not normal. This was a magical moment. You, you can see air, air fuel mixture, go in the combustion chamber. This is intake, no, in, fire. Intake is, is when it's sucking in. Right. Intake. Yeah. Fire. Intake valve closes, closes fire. exhaust stroke. Yes. And Another intake. intake. Right. So can you run two cylinders off of one carburetor? Oh yeah. Yeah. Really? Or three or four. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. The the carburetor, all it does is mix fuel and air. And yeah, you got one carburetor runs eight cylinders. Are you serious? Yeah. So it's running really, really fast. Eight. Did you notice the confidence in his face when he said that? It was, uh, I just love that moment. I, I, I said, you can run how many? And he, you know, four, eight. And I said, really? He's like, yeah. Like, like I've done this my whole life. What's wrong with you, child? I, I love the moment. I'm going to show it again. Like valve closes, closes fire. exhaust stroke. Yes. And Another intake. intake. Right. So can you run two cylinders off of one carburetor? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or really? three or four. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. The, the carburetor, all it does is mix fuel and air and... Yeah, you got one carburetor runs eight cylinders. Are you serious? Yeah. So it's running really, really fast. Each cylinder sucks in what it can use, burns it, sucks in only what it can use. Uh, Volumetrically. Right. Now, my motorcycle has a carburetor for each cylinder, and you have to balance those. Because if you have one, one that's hitting harder because it's getting a different... Right, it won't run smooth at all. So the advantage of running multiple cylinders off of one carburetor is you get the same stoichiometric mixture throughout. Yes. You can see the vortex behind the throttle. Do you see that? You can. Oh, it is. Okay, this is important. So that little vortex behind the throttle, it's it's what it sounds like it is, and it's also not. So as we go forward and we, we play the zoomed-in view, what I want you to look at is, um, we'll go top down here. Boom. Coffee cam. So... There's two things going on here. Number one, um, it is a good thing to have a secondary venturi, venturi on the back side of the throttle right here. So as the fuel comes, the fuel air mixture comes here, it gets compressed again, and you have a little vortex that happens on the back side of I call them butterflies. I don't know what the official term is. A little vortex happens there. But in the slow motion that you see, if you look. This is the intake manifold here. This is just another 3D printed part. You'll notice that it's square. So it's square going down to a circle and there's a sharp edge there. That's bad. That um, This was a casualty of wanting a flat plate to see through. I wanted the, you know, and Trent and I went back and forth in this. I wanted this front plate to be flat. In fact, here's some of the early prototypes. These are some of the early prototypes. Um, you know, th there's a few things, well, there's many things wrong with the design. You can see that we had stress concentrations on the end um, there. You can see that's very, very tiny there. Knew that. Uh, that was uh, not intentional, but we tried to make it as small as possible. The ridges were an attempt to hold the throttle and choke in place. Uh, didn't work. 
Um, this was the first drawing I did. I was like, hey, this is what I want. I want to be able to see everything on one thing. Um, I don't know. It's really fun how you can go through design iterations. But one casualty of wanting the flat plate on the front here is if you look down in it like that, that fuel-air mixture is going to hit that inner edge, and there's going to be some vortices there that are not desirable. So we're not seeing true flow like it would into an exhaust manifold because a, a good engineer would actually take the time and spend you know all the they probably do computational fluid dynamics today cfd and figure out how to get it to flow down in there unless they wanted an extra vortex i don't know it's very interesting to think about it was not intentional and you will see the secondary vortex i'm talking about in a second it is turbulent flow is a vort vortices turbulence yeah absolutely you're just trying to get me riled up because you know derek might watch this video derek, yeah <laughs> i like derek i like derek uh, Sam Cyanide, yes, uh, Gordon McGlattery, a shell in the pit, his team makes the slow-mo sounds. We've worked together for years. What would you change on this design, like, now? What would you change? I, I would make the controls stiffer so that when you put them in position, they would hold themselves. Okay. The engine sucks the throttle open, yes. Oh, does it? It does run away. If you don't physically restrain it, it gets faster and faster and faster. Really? There's no governor, yes. It's trying to pull that open, and I'm holding it there so that it does not because I don't want it to run away. Right. You feel how tough it is to move this? Yes. It's difficult to move on purpose. I understand carburetors now. Better? Way better. Yeah, yeah I, I, mean, I guess nobody actually 100% understands. Well, that. I couldn't do what I wanted to do. I could not make it run because it wouldn't hold its setting in the position. But, man, it worked. So, when you just went wide open, would it run wide open? Well, I didn't want it to run away. Try it. We got a fire extinguisher. There is so much being communicated in this moment that you don't see, that I do. And that's because I know my dad. And um, dad is doing a couple things here. He's saying, okay, here's the deal. I know, I know you do this YouTube thing. And I know that it's, you know, it's working for you. But I'm here, and I'm running this engine for you, and we're doing this together, and you want me to break a tiller? <laughs> and uh, that look he gave me, he's communicating on multiple levels, and you're only seeing the nice one. Dad is a nice guy. He's a nice guy. There's only been a few times in my life where we've gone, uh, where I was wrong, and he corrected me heavily, and he should. Um, but in this particular case, this is wisdom talking to a young buck, and he's saying, no, this is not smart. We shouldn't do this. And the correct response from a young person is, yes, sir. Uh, you, we are going to stop and do what you say because you are clearly the more experienced person here, and that's what we did. Well, you got centrifugal forces. You, you can tear the engine up. You can run way too fast. You've got governors. You've got throttle. You've got control in a factory-built carburetor that we don't have here. You could get, you could. I could get hurt? We could tear the end in all the pieces. Okay. By supplying more, it'll run faster than it's designed to run. Can you zoom into that? Is yes, sir, I can. I can get a tighter lens, we can zoom in, and we can see the, the fuel come up into the Venturi, and then we can get see it vaporize. Away. Get yes. Away. You want to do that? Yeah. Well, let's run it steady state as fast as you're comfortable. I'll try to, but I can't. I'm going to have to put a finger right there. I think it'll just start right now without a choke. I Put think a it's finger warm. or a finger? A finger? <laughs> okay. Got it. Almost kill it. That's a good carburetor. You see the secondary vortices I'm talking about behind the, the throttle butterfly? It's because of the square edge moving into the intake manifold. That's probably only in the corner. So the fuel is coming up into the jet. That's the main jet, right? Where is that entering? Right there? Yes, it's coming straight up in the middle of Venturi, and yeah. then the intake blows air. Blows air across it. Look at all the stuff dancing down there. Let's run it again and just look at the top of the fuel in the bowl. I just want to see what that looks like. The mechanical oscillations are way more violent than I expected. Well, the engine's running pretty fast right there. 
Each time you see a shake is a, a stroke, isn't it? No, I don't think so. You don't? I think it's a vibration mode. I think it's a harmonic. You think it's a tuning fork? I do. Well, there should be four, should be intake, compression, power stroke, power stroke exhaust. So yes. you should have four strokes for each. And you do have, if you look at it right there, one, two, three, suck. One, two, three, suck. One, two, three, suck. Top dead center and bottom dead center. You're pretty smart for a redneck. Well, that's why they call it four stroke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I must have watched that moment a hundred times. No, maybe not. That's a lie. I must have watched that moment at least 20 times. I like the way it goes, well, that's why they call it four stroke. Because I, I was complimenting him, right? But he didn't know how to take the compliment because he doesn't. And uh, I want to watch it again. Make it 22. I do. Well, there should be four, should be intake, compression, power stroke, so power stroke exhaust. So yes. you should have four strokes for each. And you do have, if you look at it right there. One, two, three, suck. One, two, three, suck. One, that two, That moment, three, I was like, oh, he's suck. right. He's totally Top right. Top dead center and bottom dead center. You're pretty smart for a redneck. Well. Well. <laughs> that's why they call it four stroke. <laughs> oh, God, I love it so okay, much. Okay, so now we understand the carburetor on a macro level. We have built a functioning carburetor, which is awesome. But now what we need to do is I want to see the tight stuff. Like what happens when that jet of fuel comes up and the air intake comes over the top of it? What does that look like? All right. Got it. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh. Music by a shell in the pit, Gordon. Okay, so when we started seeing this, I can't tell you, like this was the moment I was like, oh my goodness, this is, we've, we've done something amazing. When you see that little bitty, a little bitty, I think Shane called it a tentacle, when you see that thing come up into the Venturi and get blown away, like this was still the side profile. We didn't understand what was happening from the other side. Let, let, me, let me just show you some of that real quick. Um, uh, let me open, let's do this. Let's go to the actual slow-mo files. Y'all want to do that? Uh, what, what do you want to see on the slow-mo files, patrons? Uh, is there anything in particular? I'm going to look at the type. There's a, there's a side thing there. Um, let's check this out. So one thing that's cool, these are the actual files. These things are gigantic. And so... Um, as I'm working on this stuff, it's like it feels like ages to process this stuff. And what's interesting is the the motor is vibrating, so it's coming in and out of focus. So right here, you can see I'm gonna turn up the uh, the gain just a little bit. You can't really see what I'm doing, and I'm gonna turn it up just a little bit, make it brighter. Um, okay, here we let's play. Boom. Let's, let's do something for fun. I haven't done this yet, but I want to do this. And so here, let, let me show you a way that you could just get some data off of this, right? So let's go to Coffee Cam. So let's get one of the prints, one of the two scale prints, which we have right here, okay? This is how I would do a back of the envelope um, kind of calculation on this. Okay, so we've got uh, our Venturi here. So if we if we look at the the slow-mo, what we need there is we need the distance between here and here, right? And and so because I want it in frame, I'm going to try to approximate. So the, if you think about this, in terms of depth of field, if I'm right up close to the camera, the distance between the front edge of that Venturi hump and the front edge of that Venturi hump, that's going to be more pixels 
than the same on the back side of the carburetor, right? So you can see that gap back there and that gap back there. So what I would do if I was like in real engineer mode is I would take that number of pixels and I would take this number of pixels and I would divide by two, I would average them. And I would say, okay, well that's how many pixels that gap is about to be. That's what I would do. I'm not gonna do that right now because of time, but let me just show you this. So um, in terms of small things, I think in inches, uh, can do other things as well, but inches are easiest to me. So this we're in the swag mode here. Uh, 0.3256, so we got three eighths of an inch, 0.325 inches, right? Point, let's just go 0.327, that makes it easy, right? Let's go back over to, sorry about that, go back over to this thing, and I'm actually gonna take a measurement. So I'm gonna measure this thing, so I'm gonna calibrate, I'm just gonna go approximately there. So I click the first in, and I'm gonna click halfway up right there. That gives me a line, 0.3327. Okay, so now, distance, angle, and speed, two points, will go from here, and then I'll go forward, and I'll look at that cloud, which is right here. It feels a lot like measuring a shock wave. So yeah, there you go, uh, about 20 meters per second. That is a huge swag, so that's nowhere close to being accurate, but let's play some more. So, um, Mato Godoy, forgive me if I mispronounce your name, asked, why did you print those butterflies in PLA? Because the Prusa was there and it was, it was easy to do. Didn't think it would be an issue. Turns out it was the heat lamps that melted these things. It wasn't the gasoline. It's suspended, that drop of fuel is suspended in the air and then the suction comes and breaks it all up. Derek is gonna love that. <laughs> <laughs> Because of turbulence? Yes. That's changing a laminar coming in here too, turbulent. Ooh! <clears throat> Converging, diverging nozzle. It, and so a carburetor is just a rocket nozzle. It's a rocket nozzle, that's yeah. what it is. Got some heat in one of the subreddits. They're like, it's not a rocket nozzle. It is because, you know, downstream of the, in the di diverging part, after supersonic, the, um, the velocity of the gas is accelerating a rocket nozzle. And that, that gave me a little existential crisis. I had to go relearn everything about rocket nozzles. <laughs> Even though I took a whole graduate course in it, I was like, why are they so angry? And then I realized people were just angry on the internet. So whatever. It's a converging, diverging thing. I'm cool with what I said. It is. I mean, you're speeding up. Watch it. Oh, 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 oh. It's a little drop and... Yep. Yeah. Carburetor tries to do is increase the surface area on a molecular level right or a what do you mean in order to get full and complete combustion you need all the surface area that you can get with the fuel because ideally you have an oxygen molecule right next to a fuel molecule mm -hmm. so now i'm going to get what happens right when you pull the rope for the first time when there's no fuel in the carb to when fuel goes in i'm gonna see what that looks like corey i see your comment about petg uh pla just prints better for me is why i use pla yeah, PETG is good for higher temperatures, but better results P PLA for me. It's fun that we almost couldn't turn it off. <laughs> There's a little bit of risk Perpetual here. Perpetual motion machine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at this. Dad used to always joke with me about perpetual motion machines. And so when I first started YouTube and I started getting all the emails about perpetual motion machines, I used to always laugh because, like, you know, Dad and I used to talk about that all the time. And so when he said that in that moment, that was particularly funny for me. What? So on the intake stroke here, you can see the rope. Pull. How cool is that? You can see the rope in the foreground, and you see the carburetor and the. I could not have imagined a shot like this. Oh wow! Yeah. Pam pam pam. Time to uh, time to mill those out of aluminum. I think that's PLA. So I bet that PLA is getting broken down by the by the, by the gasoline because it wasn't that flimsy to begin with. You can see the fuel. I'm actually gonna start. I think I'm gonna mill these out of aluminum, or I might, just to try to figure out how to do that. Um, you may have noticed in the background of this particular video, uh, there's a CNC mill and a CNC lathe here. There was a, a local nonprofit that was focused on teaching 
students how to run machines like that. And they, uh, unfortunately, COVID, uh, they were a victim of COVID. And, but they were able to work a deal with me to let me use the CNC mill and lathe. And so I'm excited about it. You know, I, I of course, purchased them. I'm excited about it because I want to try to learn CNC programming. If you followed Smarter Every Day on Instagram, you've seen me trying. And Jeremy Fielding's working with me on that. It's really, really fun. In fact, he was working with the CNC lathe today. But um, that's a really challenging part. And I actually talked to a buddy of mine named Josh about how to do that. And he had some ideas. That's, that's a hard part to, to machine out of, out of aluminum. Coming up in the, in the straw, in the jet. Look at that. You can see you can. The, you see that the flow rate there. You can see everything. For the next shot, we wanted to see if we could shoot the high speed down the throat of the Venturi. So Trent jumped in to help because we needed more hands. Just pop the choke out and then we're just going to look straight down the barrel. I can need to block about three-fourths or at least half of it. Yeah. All right, so that's going to lean our mixture, right? Yeah. You're, are you pulling focus? I'm going to have to once it's running. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to have to meter it with your finger there. Yeah. So I'll meter it with my finger and you grab the throttle. The throttle's wide open right now, but it shuts off automatically. This is when the understanding started to happen. Like, yeah, I had understanding once I saw a few of them, but once Dad and I were communicating about who was going to be the choke, who was going to be the throttle, so to speak, instead of letting like an engine... A normal carburetor has built-in controls that'll automatically do it. Like, the, for example, the spring on the throttle side of uh one of these one of these carburetors like it it is geared in such a way that it will automatically open and demand more fuel um but dad took that role and instead of having the choke side be you know the the turtle uh turtle rabbit that's me this time and so i didn't really run it like a normal choke would be operated i kind of operated the throttle from the choke side in a really weird way but um in this moment one thing that I really like about the video, and I made sure to, to include this, watch me try to choke out the engine. And then after I choke out the engine, you'll see dad's hand come down and he physically grabs my hand and he pulls my hand away from the engine. And he's like, let me run the engine. But it, it's a directive. It's not, an, it's, it's, he's not asking me, he's removing my hand. <laughs> it, it's really a neat moment. So if you'll grab it and shove it back the other way. That way? Keep it there, yeah. Right here. Got it? Hold on. I'm in trouble with my head. Hold on. I can literally throttle it with my thumb. Oh. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. Okay. So, so the reason I put my hand in there is because I saw gas coming out the choke side, and I was like, that's probably bad. I don't want you to have any. Oh, I'm getting it. Oh my goodness. There's your vapor. There's your vapor. I saw there. the vapor. There's a vapor right there. Got it? Where it coming out? No, in the intake manifold. Oh yeah. Whoa. Okay, this is pretty cool. So um, I'll just put this on there so you can see it. That vapor that you see there, one thing I didn't cover in this video is you've heard people say, oh, choke it till the car warms up or till the engine warms up and then you can back off choke, right? The reason you do that is the intake manifold will heat up and the engine will heat up. And as that mechanically mixed fuel enters into the, inter the intake manifold, it will vaporize because the temperature goes up, right? And think about your, you know, your, you know, the plot. So it vaporizes. And so at the end, when it doesn't fire that last stroke, or it doesn't more accurately doesn't input that, but you have the intake manifold that's hot, it creates this vapor. And so if you, if you look again in the wide shot, you can actually see that vapor materialize instantly before my eyes. And I wasn't expecting it, and I didn't know, I didn't know it was going to be there. And so that was, that was really uh, an interesting moment. So let's watch that. I don't want you to have any. Oh, I'm getting it. Oh my goodness. There's your vapor. There's your vapor. I saw the vapor. Cool? There's a vapor right there. Got it? Where it coming out? No, in the intake manifold. Oh yeah. Whoa. 
And uh, Zap Wizard asks, is that what Vaporlock is? No, I thought it was. Uh, I asked Dad about that. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know what Vaporlock is, but um, I thought it was really interesting. So I, I need to read up on Vaporlock more. I had a calculus teacher, Coach Booth, used to say, boy, are you Vaporlock? Stare at the board. Give me the answer. And then he would say, kick it up and divide by it to tell us how to integrate. That's that's vapor. Yep. Okay, so vapor going what away. just happened is dad cranked it. I covered, I choked it with my hand. He was operating throttle. For a second there, we were, yeah, we were vibing. We were insane. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I was running choke. Dad was running throttle. Trent was trying to frame the shot. Oh! I just hit your mic. It flattens the dropout. It does. It does. It flattens the dropout and it distributes it. Look at it! This is magical. <laughs> I now have a three-dimensional understanding of how carburetor intake air interacts with the fuel coming up in the main jet. That was worth it. This journey started by simply asking my dad how carburetors work and by taking the time to... Um, okay, we got an answer to the vapor lock question. So um, Matt says air leaking through the axle holes made the engine hard to stop. That's absolutely true. Um, that's what's going on. Zach Musser says vapor lock is when your gas cap vent is clogged, so the pressure is too high for the gas to leave the tank. Is that does that mean too low or too high on the the engine side? I guess that's what you mean. Um, very interesting. All right, here we go. Uh, this is the montage. This is just the beauty montage to appreciate how beautiful it is. So I find that often it's really interesting to to deep dive into the engineering side of things. But also, it's valuable to sit back and just watch something and marvel and just like think and experience it on a different level, like on the beauty level or on the appreciation level. And so that's what this was that you're about to see, this, this little music montage at the end. Side note, the music you're about to hear was written by Gordon McGladdery of Shell in the Pit. The music is called Explode Face Destroyer of Worlds. That's the official title of this track. You can Google that to build and operate one by hand, we learned that the design of a carburetor is simple yet very complex. And the fluid dynamics at play are downright beautiful. So I know a lot of times I thought that was beautiful. Uh, I when really, you get to the ad portion of a video, people kind of like click. Sorry about that. I thought that was beautiful. It was a, uh, a really fun moment um, just to look at everything and check out how it works. Uh, this, this particular ad is about something I want to do, which is learn Python. Uh, so I would be interested to know uh, if you guys use Python for anything in particular. I, I am not proficient in Python. When I was in school, I learned Fortran, and uh, Dad actually taught me uh, GW Basic and QBasic. I used to make, um, I used to make all kinds of little goofy programs. Uh, I'd make a lot of batch files. I, when we had DOS, I would, uh, I made batch files to quote automate my computer. All, all I had was DOS games, and I would say, you know, I would, t I would type in, "Hey, I forget what I named my computer. Hey, D." And D would say, what game would you like to play, Destin? And I had all these categories. I could select a category, and then I could go select the game. 
it was a really fun thing. So uh, that's something I used to do back in the day. But I'm interested in getting into Python. I'm just not good at it. I mean, that's that's something I really need to do. So let's move forward here, and I just want to uh, these things at the end here. All right, so let's pull these up. So uh, these little moments with Dad here at the end are fantastic. Uh, Austin Burnham says, Python is great for a lot of things. I use it for test scripts and work. Everybody loves Python, apparently. Wow. You guys are all about the Python. Writing in Python right now. I like QBasic and Basic A. I, I don't know about Basic A. Data analysis with pandas. Don't know what that means. I'm going to have to figure that out. Let's watch this moment with Dad. Bye. What do you think, Dad? It's a lot of work. It's what I think. It's not as fun as what I thought it would be from a distance. When I'm sitting at the keyboard and reading the comments, uh, it's fun. But taking the video shots, I don't even want to think about editing. There are not many people that I know can say that they have made a carburetor from scratch. I wouldn't necessarily call this scratch. But now, people who actually work on small engines could give you a lot more educated words than what you're getting. <laughs> I don't want a person that is paid to work on small engines. I want to learn about carburetors from my dad. <laughs> you could have picked anybody going down the street. <laughs> I think you're doing all right. You got more information. I think you're doing just fine. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed that. I mean, uh, I super duper enjoyed making this video on so many different levels. Um, uh, Trent did a great job designing uh, the, the carburetor under the watchful eye of several different uh, silverback gorillas. And so I, I thought that was really fun as well to use this as an opportunity to teach a young engineer. So what I'd love to do is uh, just for a couple of minutes here, take some questions. If you guys are interested in knowing anything specifically, I have, I have all the iterations of the design here. For example... Um, you know, we've got some of the first uh, bowls that we created. We originally took a, a two-part, um, a two-part thing there, um, where we initially were going to make it a certain way, and then we went back and made it a different way. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff there that we did. So that was really cool. We eventually came to this. You know, we had a lid here, the venturi, and the lid of the bowl, and then we ended up. Uh, on the integrated design so we could seal it with one plate. This is the actual one we used in the video. And you'll notice on the back, something you couldn't see, there's, there's a vent here. So this is the vent that vents the bowl to atmospheric pressure. And on the other side here, this is where the gas went in to the needle uh, to fill up the bowl. That's what that is. Okay, here come the questions. Let's do it. All right, so um, let me see if I can figure out how to... Uh, answer these questions okay so austin says how much time do you spend with your dad on this project uh about two days that's about two days i went over there to his house um and uh once i was there you know i just recorded everything in about an hour and a half actually went away um worked with this stuff with trent designed this over the course of many many months just kind of in the background of other things that were going on and uh invited him to the final design review and um, dad's really good at checking parts. He's a metrologist. And so he did things like uh, explain design for manufacturability and things like that. Things you don't know when you just learn how to do CAD, but you don't know how to make parts. And so dad participated in that along with Jeremy and Dave, uh, David uh, Linderman and myself. And then after that, the one day of shooting. And that's pretty much what dad did. Um, okay, so Matthew Farmer says, how long is the venturi let's see if i can read the rest of your comment how long is the venturi i guess it to be about 3.75 inches uh well we have ways to figure that out so let's do that um i don't remember from the, the print let's go yep 3.7 you're pretty close 3.7 inches there, Matthew. Good job. Um, is there usually excess on the throttle side of the butterfly? Um, Vic asked that. No, not really. Uh, there's not usually an excess there. We, um, we eventually, here, I'll pull this up so you can see this. We eventually get it figured out. Um, 
you know, once it starts running with uh, a consistent mixture, uh, it, it, it does pretty good. You don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. My face is kind of out of frame. Oh, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Boom. Learning how learning how to do the live stream. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it here. Marco says, the cross-sectional area of the tube that brings the fuel from the bowl to the Venturi seems super important. Any smaller, you might not get enough. How did you know how big to make it? And the answer is trial and error. If you think about it, a carburetor is essentially a calibrated leak and it leaked too much to begin with, and there was too much fuel coming up into the Venturi, so the answer was 3D print a little plug and stick it into the, the little gas line. There you go. Let's see what else. Uh, how do you determine the Bible verses you include at the end of the video? It just depends. Um, this question is from whoever I just pinned the question from. I, I can't see it. Um, it, it just depends, Camden. Um, I, I typically try to stay away from just straight up Jesus quotes in the New Testament because I don't want to uh, offend my Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, I I typically go Old Testament and usually from a book of wisdom because it's kind of hard to, like if you don't like it, it's okay. It's it, And that's why I put them there at the end so they can be looked up if you choose to. I don't want to force my faith on anybody ever, but the reason I put them there is because it, of course, is a, a big inspiration for me um, being a Christian and all. But uh, I thought uh, this time it was only appropriate to do something about, you know, honoring your father and mother. So this particular one is uh, Proverbs 1.8. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. For their, It's basically the beginning of Proverbs. Uh, for their graceful garland for your head and penance for your neck. It's the beginning of Proverbs uh, where it's talking about wisdom. And there's this process that I think is like moving from ignorance to knowledge, to understanding, to wisdom. And I think in my life, I'm kind of at the place where I'm trying to move from knowledge to understanding. That's where I'm at. Acknowledging that, you know, other people that are far wiser than I am have, you know, they're, they're at a much different place than me. And so um, that's that's kind of where I'm at in my life. I'm trying to move from knowledge to, wi to understanding and Hopefully, I would get to wisdom someday, and, that, and that's why I decided to go with that particular book um, from Wisdom of Proverbs there. Okay. Oh, Noah said he walked in at the perfect time. He's Jewish. Yeah, Noah. I do that for you. You are the... I think about Noah when uh, when when I select that verse. Okay. Let's do... Um, can you tell us about any upcoming projects you're excited about? Yes, I can, Benjamin. Um, one thing I'm really excited about is... We've been working on the supersonic baseball cannon, and I hope to do a couple of really interesting things with that. Yeah, okay, well, I guess that is a good place to to end the live stream. I want to say thanks to all the patrons of Smarter Every Day. You guys have supported for a while here at uh, patreon.com slash smartereveryday. I'm grateful. Um, I hope you enjoyed this live stream. This is my first time doing it. This... I got a like a, a button pushy thing over here, and I'm doing my best. I'm trying my best. So uh, if you have suggestions for how I can improve this, please let me know uh, in the comments on Patreon. Um, what I'll do is I will wait maybe a week, and then I'll take what we've done here, and I'll edit it up and put it on the Smarter Every Day 2 channel for the public to see. But uh, I wanted to make sure that we get to interact, you know, you the patrons that make this whole thing possible. I'm grateful. And uh, I just want to say thank you. So that's it. I am Destin. You're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it.